Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to our Sunday night service. Preaching was good this morning, wasn't it? Preaching was really good this morning. All right. What time is it? I'm to have church. I'm to church. Announcement. Just in case you are interested in End of the Age, it's on 258, the church channel, at 9 o'clock on Saturday night. There's going to be a meeting in the air.
Glory to God. You can tell that we still have some people out. I ain't sure where they're at. I ain't sure what's going on. I know we got some sick ones. So we need to lift them up in the prayer. We need to continue to pray for Sister Debbie. Uh, I know Sister Debbie and uh, Gladys and Jordan and Sister Joyce uh, Janice said to pray for uh, leave your sister Kathy. She has had a stroke, so we need to remember her. Uh, is there any more? Uh, Sister French, we need to continue to pray for Sister French. <laughs> yeah, and Brother Jeff. Yes, Jim, uh, Brother Jim's dad, Sister Alicia. Uh, yes, yes. We need to continue to pray for uh, Dwayne Hardwell. Uh, he is going to see the brain specialist. I know that God, I know personally that God is a healer of that. Right. And I know that the Adams family knows that God is a healer of the brain. So we can have the faith and the knowledge All right. of God healing us. So let's just put our hands upon him. Let's spread on the throne of God. I know, I know without a shadow of a doubt that God can touch the way he can put him and pull him through. Amen. Yes, amen. A friend of mine who grew up, his dad had a stroke last night, so he's asking us to pray for him. Yeah, yeah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Jeff, hold on to the Lord. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you, God. Lord, we pray, Jesus, that you, your healing virtue will flow from this house up to these bodies, Lord Jesus. And we lift them to you, O oh God. Jesus, I ask for Sister Prince, Lord, I pray that you will touch my body, Lord, that you remove this sickness from her, Lord. God, right now, Jesus, I pray for Jim and Dan, Lord. I pray that you will miraculously touch him, Lord, and this belly will continue to go down. Lord, that you want to heal him, that you want to give him many years of life.
prayers come forth they are with me today there will be a day of visitation in which you will hear from heaven where you will see prayers answered and you will know that it is I the Lord thy God
And I want to thank the Lord for still having connections in Arkansas. A few weeks ago, the church there had a revival. And every night of their revival, they had three different visitors Beautiful. show up at least. On one night, they had six visitors from the area, Hallelujah. from the town. Brother Russell, in that revival, they had three different people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That excites me to know that God's moving there. Yes. Because if God can move there, can move here. He can move here. Right. Somebody hear me. If they're having revival, we're having revival. That's right. That's exactly Come on in. He should have gave me the microphone. Right. Amen. I love the Lord and I'm glad to be in his house. And the Lord spoke to us tonight. He said, the day is coming when we're going to see the answer prayers. So I leave you with this. The time to stop praying is not now. No. I, I believe it's time we dust off those prayers that we got tired of praying.
sweet presence of the Lord has been here all day and all day. Let's just continue just for a moment. Can we just talk to the Lord? Just tell him how much you love him tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you.
Sensory adaptation means when you have adapted to certain senses. We have the five senses of hearing, the uh, taste, uh, outside. Yeah, all those. It's been a while since I worried about them. And uh, we become, we adapt to things. Uh, I had an old truck one time, and uh, I, I, I love that old truck. It was a full-size Chevy truck, and uh, I got 325,000 miles on that thing, and the engine was still running. The rest of the truck fell apart, but, but, but the engine was still strong. But there, I was so used to that truck, Brother Charlie, that I didn't pay attention to the sounds of the truck. And there was all kinds of noises and sounds that came out of that truck. And my son Rick one time said, Dad, I need to borrow your truck. And I said, okay. And for those of you that know me, loaning out my vehicles is very, very difficult for me. But he, he really didn't need it. So I said, all right. So he left his car on a Sunday night after church. And I gave him the keys. And he took my truck. And uh, I was going on and doing what I do after church, shaking hands. and and talking to people and getting ready to lock up when Rick walked back in the door and he came over and handed me the keys. And I said, I thought you needed the truck. He said, I can't drive your truck. There are sounds coming out of that truck that was never meant to come out of the vehicle. And he says, I can't do it. But I was adapted to it. I was used to it. To where the sounds didn't mean anything to me. I, I've noticed, I, I bought this truck that I've got now, and, and I found myself listening to the different sounds of the truck, getting used to it. And uh, I don't know, there's probably sounds in it that probably not supposed to be there, but I don't know, so I don't pay attention to it. But, but my point is, is that we hear things. But after a while, we become accustomed to it. To where we don't hear like we used to. A mother is very attuned to a newborn baby. Every little sound that little newborn baby makes causes that mother to spring up and, and to act upon it. Sister Alyssa is about to find this out firsthand. Uh, that, that, that newborn makes sounds. Everything's fine, but because a new mother is so attuned to that baby, now, when they're six and seven years old and they're saying, Mommy, and she doesn't hear them. And they're saying, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. And she's busy. She has tuned that kid out. Well, come on. I know none of you mothers want to admit this. But us dads are pros at it. I mean, I'm not even going to go in the direction how we tune out our wives. Not even going to go there. But we become accustomed to things. We hear things. Larry Brown, who was one of the, in my opinion, one of the greatest basketball minds and coaches in history. He has won an NCAA championship in college. He's won an NBA championship as a coach. And, and he's one of the best coaches. But he travels around a lot. He doesn't stay with a team very long. He, he moves on from team to team. And somebody asked him one time, said, Coach, why don't you stay? And he said, because a coach that is teaching after about three years, they don't hear you anymore. They need a different voice. Because we become accustomed. I even made a comment this morning. It's important sometimes, even in pastoring church, that we put different voices up behind the pulpit. Because even with here, as much as I know you folks love me and I appreciate it and I love you, yet if all you heard was my voice, after a while, it wouldn't mean as much. It's just human nature. And so we need the different voices. But what I feel in the Holy Ghost tonight is Jesus was telling John the Revelator, and I didn't read all seven churches, but he ended each letter to each church with the same thing. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And I don't know if you've noticed, but in the past few weeks, months, maybe six weeks, God has been talking to this church. He's been dealing with a lot of things in this church. But the main thing ever since, maybe about five, six weeks ago now, when he spoke to us through a message of tongue and interpretation, that he's waiting on us and we've sought him. 
and we prayed and we're seeking Him and we're still praying because we want to we want God to hear us. We want to know, Lord, if you're waiting on us, what do we need to understand this? And the Bible and, and the preaching. I preached along the lines of you're as close to God as you want to be. We heard this morning a great message on commitment. I believe the Lord is calling this church and, and he's waiting on this church to come out of our comfort zone. To come out of the level where we're comfortable and we're okay where we are. And he's asking this church, I need you to step up a little bit. I need you to step up a little closer. You need to come out of where you've been for so long that you become comfortable where you are. I know I'm, I'm preaching in spirits tonight. I can feel them coming against me. I don't know if you understand that, but many times when you're preaching a message, you can feel spirits that rise up. That, 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 that the adversary does not want me to preach this because the greatest fear the devil would have with this church is that we would step up and that we would come out of the right zone and that we would be coming up as the church that the Bible talks about. That we would reach out to a lost and not sin. That we love them so much that we're willing to do whatever it takes. That he that has him here, let him hear what the Spirit said. Come on! Come on! If you'll just come a little closer, feel the Holy Ghost tonight. I'm not going to preach long and know it's not because of the Colts game. Thank you very much. <laughs> Brother Gary told J.D. and we have a short service tonight because the Colts are on TV tonight. That is not that going to happen. <laughs> now I got that on my chest. <laughs> oh, something in me is saying, Lord, I want to get into your presence and I want to get as close as I can because I hear the voice of God calling me and saying, Rick, come us a little bit higher. If you're willing to come just a little bit further, there's a realm up here. See, in the, in the Old Testament, the Bible says that the, the, the God told Moses to draw a line around the mountain, that the, he didn't want everybody coming up the mountain, and then they took 70 elders, and they went up about a third of the mountain, and they stayed there, and they only went up about one third, and then they were happy, and then Moses and Joshua and some others went a little bit, two-thirds maybe up the mountain, and there Joshua stayed, but Moses was the only one that was willing to go to the top because it was fearful up there, then because it was covered in a dark cloud. Don't tell me God's not in the darkness, but I'm telling you, it was a dark cloud, and only Moses, everybody else got to a certain, is anybody here what I'm saying? Everybody else went to a certain level, and then they were happy there, and they were fine there, and they were willing to stay there, even Joshua only went up so far and then he stayed but Moses said I know you're up there somewhere and I'm going to find you in that cloud and I'm going to find you where you are Lord and that's where God and I'm preaching to somebody tonight none of the ones here tonight that have a walk with God and I'm thankful for every one of you that's got a walk with God this is not a church full of sinners although I wish that I had a bunch of them here but most of us here have the Holy Ghost for a while and I'm thankful because every one of us has a love of God a little something calling me tonight and saying, but we've got to get to the point. We may be content, but we cannot be satisfied. We may be happy with what blessings that we say about such a bad, but don't let us get to the point where we're satisfied where we are. See, I'm confident so good to me. God has been so good to me. I can't complain. I, as a preacher, I, can, I, don't, I don't know that I can have any better. I pastor a great group of people. I, I love every one of you. You mean so much to me. Every one of you means so much to me. And I thank every one of you here tonight. There are some that can't be here tonight. And I appreciate them so much. God has given me a sweet life. I love her, and I'm, I'm so appreciative tonight of what the Lord has done in life, Sister Lisa, to be a part of my life. I love her, and God's been good to me. I'm so thankful tonight for my kids and my grandkids. I, I know they drive everybody in the world crazy with their mind. I got kids tonight that scare me to death. My two boys, I don't even want to go with my daughter, dear Lord, 
Jesus, help us. And you know what? They're mine. And they're healthy. And God's protected them. I was telling Sister Cindy and Rose Steve last night about some of the things my son and Rick went through in Fallujah when they were cleaning out the terrorist group there in Afghanistan and Northern Iraq and how some of the things he went through. And it's just, it's amazing what some of our soldiers had to go through to fight for our freedom. And we ought to be thankful every day that we have what we have. And thank you. Thank you. We appreciate the willingness of the military and pray for us. That's a tough game, but thank God somebody's got to do it. But just kidding. But at the same time, they're mine, but my grandkids, I'm happy, I'm thrilled. God's been good to me. He's given my wife and I five healthy kids, seven daughter, and son in law, daughter in law, and, and 16 great grandkids. I tell somebody, they said, How many? I said, 16. They said, well, How many is yours and hers? I said, I got 15. She's got one. <laughs> It's like Wally Pitt joined Babe Ruth when Babe Ruth hit 60 home runs when he got on the news and said, me and Babe Ruth hit 62 home runs this year. He hit 60 and I hit two. But I, I always tell people, but her one can keep up with my 15. I can take it out. I, I, love, I love what God's done. I'm content. I'm not satisfied. I'm not satisfied. There's something yearning. My ears are hearing something that's different. I'm hearing sounds from another world uh, that, that I don't hear in this world. And I want to encourage somebody. Maybe you're listening to too many voices of this world and you need to shut some of the voices off because those voices are not going to take you where God wants to take you. And we need to not have certain voices in life. We need to shut off some voices. So I want to preach this just for a minute. You need to be careful who you listen to. You need to be careful what you listen to. You need to, I can get on here right now and I can get on a bandwagon about country music and, and rock music and God forbid rap and all this other nonsense. But let me tell you something, it goes deeper than that. I, I, I'm not worried about all that so much as I'm worried what voice am I willing to listen to. I need a voice in my life that will say, come on, look, we can do this. Come on, we can do this. I don't need some naysayer getting on my case and saying, I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you did this. No, I don't care. If all they want to do is talk about my past, they're the ones in the past. But if I get somebody, they'll say, no, let's not worry about yesterday. What are we going to do today? Where are we going to go tomorrow? That's what's important in my life. I thought about this when Sister Kayla was doing the song about Redeem. I thought about you, Sister Sarah Jo, and all those critics. You got down there in that where you live, and all the critics in Sandal that want to you know, criticize you. Just remember one thing. You've been redeemed, and they can't touch that. Concerned with whether the world thinks I'm 
become successful. He didn't tell you to be successful. He just said be faithful on the way. So if I pastor a church of 50 from now until Jesus comes, or if God blesses me and I pastor a church of 500 here in Patoka, it doesn't matter. The number has nothing to do with what he's going to say to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant, not how many people you got in church. So if I'm faithful to this church and the people that I got sitting here right now, then God will honor that. And God always honors that. I don't know, I wasn't trying to preach it, that I feel it strong tonight. You need to hear the spirit of the Lord. We need to be faithful. Hear the voice in your life and weed out the naysayers and the critics and the critiquers. <laughs> And, and, and I got up to preach a revival one night, and there was about four or five visiting preachers. And I just, I don't know, every now and then Jesus needs to help me. But I turned around and I said, I want all you critics that's going to see him critique me, get your notepads out because you're going to be busy. If you come to critique me, I hope you brought an iPad so you can type facts. If you come to criticize me, you're going to be a busy individual tonight. But for all those that are here that just want to hear what the Lord has to say, you're going to have a great time. I've got beyond, I don't care what the critics say. I've got beyond that. I don't care what the critiquers want to say. I don't care. Some might say, well, you don't use the King's English. Well, I don't use Brother Steve's English either. He had not a. You figure it out. He eats a sandwich. I eat a sandwich. But you know what? If we're both full at the end, that's all that really matters. Amen. The voice I want to hear is a spirit, a voice from another world that's telling me I'm here. Come. Yes. Come. Come up a little higher. I know we're thankful that the Lord came down to us in salvation, but when it comes to dedication, he comes up to a certain time, and then he says, come on. Come on. He, I preached on this not too long ago. He told James John, it's not for me to give. It's up for you. How deep do you want to go in this? How deep do you want to go in God? How much do you want to learn? How much of the depths of the Holy Ghost do you really want to get into? He told Ezekiel, he's put him up on a mountain there and he, and, and, on the precipice of the, of the temple, and there was a body of water out there. He said, I want you to go out 1,000 cubits. And cubits in Bible days of 18 to 22 inches, depending on the length of the head or the elbow of the king. And so but that was what they measured by. And so he walked out in this body of water 1,000 cubits. Now, if I took the time to count 1,000, I'd be here a while. Well, 1,000, about the step of a man. 1,000 cubits. And the Bible says when he got out there, he was 1,000 cubits into the water. Think in terms of if you've ever been to the ocean. And you walk 1,000 cubits out into the ocean and you're only ankle deep. Okay? He gets out there and he's 1,000 cubits. And he's quite away from the land now. And he's, he's in ankle deep water. He's now on. And the Lord said, go out another 1,000 cubits. So he walks out another thousand cubits. Takes him a while. And the Bible says that when he got out there, he was knee deep. This is a long beach. Now, 2,000 cubits, he's knee deep. But remind you, if you've ever walked in the ocean, walking in knee deep water is not as easy as ankle deep water. And the deeper you get, the harder it's going. Oh, I would sit by hearing right now. Have you got an ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying? We're saying come up a little deeper. Go, go out a little deeper. Come up a little higher. But it's going to take a little bit more effort. You're not just going to walk your preacher way through this. You're not going to be able, if you want to see what God has for you, you're not going to be able to just kind of play your little game and just go home and that's it. No, 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 no. You're going to have to put some more, some, more, some effort. You're going to give it some that extra effort if you want to get to where God wants us to be. That's right. Now he's in knee deep. Then he says, okay, Lord, now what? He said, go another thousand cubits. Now he can tell him the Bible says, now it's waist deep. It's not near as easy to walk in waist deep water as it is in ankle deep water. But some people are happy 
in the kiddie pool. Some people are fine in the ankle deep water. Some people's fine over there in the shallow end. But there's some of us tonight that I believe in the Holy Ghost. Maybe you haven't got there yet. But there's a desire to say, I want to go just a little bit deeper. I want to go just a little bit further. I'm hearing what you're saying, Jesus. I hear your voice calling me. Calling me out. And they got the day got the waist deep. But he said, come on out. And the Bible says he got out to where he's floating. And he said, come out here where he swim in the deep waters. And there's many fish out there. Hear me right now. When Jesus called the disciples, they were fishing. And he said, follow me. And I will make you fish. So then the fish in the sea represent the souls of men. If you want to reach some souls, then you're not going to get them in the angle deep water. You're not going to get them to live in a shallow walk with God. You know, if you want to be a revivalist, if you're going to want to be a soul winner, then you're going to have to go out there with a fish on. And that means you're going to have to win somebody with you me right now. you got to be willing to swim out there. you got to be willing to go into the depths of the sea out there where God wants us to come. 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 Come out here. Come on out here. I want to show you something. Tonight I feel the Holy Ghost even at the ears. If anybody's hearing me right now, I hope you're not just listening to the words I'm saying, but hearing what the Holy Ghost is saying to the Pentecostal Church of Patoka, that God has brought us to this point, at this time, for this reason. He's waiting for us to say, where's the deep breath? Where's the deep breath? Say, Brother Frank's going out there scary, yeah? I know one. I know. I can't swim. Can't swim. 62 years old. I still can't swim. I know that's almost, that's crazy. But I just always felt safer on land. Now, I like going out on a boat. I like going out kayaks. I like going out camping on the water. But you won't catch me out there without a life jacket. I look like a bobber. Float in water. <laughs> and you can laugh all you want to, but I can have just as much fun bobbing on the water as you do going under. <laughs> well, and, but hear what I'm saying. Because there's people in the spirit that's just afraid to go out of the depths of the Holy Ghost is people like me that can't swim to go out into the deeper waters of the ocean or a lake. But see, the beautiful thing is with this in the spirit, you don't need a life jacket. Jesus is with you. I saw something in that I love that said, you wouldn't be afraid of waters. The Savior walked on water. Hallelujah. Oh, here. But the Spirit say the church come. I don't want to be to come so used to Pentecost. Can I preach this older folks got this for a moment? Those of us have been in this thing for a while, let's not get to the point. We are so used to what we're used to, and we become adapted to it, that we no longer hear the cry of a new convert. That we get to the point where we got a spiritual toddler that's saying, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. But we tune them out. That we've got to the point now where we tune out certain things because we've been in this for a while. But somehow, Lord, help us to have a, a sensitivity to the Holy Ghost that we can hear what you're saying to the church and is speaking to us tonight in a way that calls deep on the deep and say, come out here because there's a glory that you have not seen or felt. And I'm going to tell you, I've been in this all my life. I've been a preacher now for 37 years. And I know what I've known. I've seen it and I've heard it. But when it gets to the point, if I think I've seen it all and I've heard it all and I know it all, then I've made myself to the point where God can't touch me. I want God to do something I've never seen. I want God to do something I've never felt. I want God to do something in my life he's never done before. I don't want to get to a point where I'm just used to everything. Joe Darwin preached a message many years ago where he talked about explainable but undeniable. Unexplainable but undeniable. 
I, I'm getting to the point, I'm going to be able to explain everything that God's doing. That's good that when God speaks like he did tonight, that we can tell visitors and explain to them what just happened. That the message in tongue interpretation was is in the Bible that God speaks to the church like that. I was in the Bible study last Thursday morning and somebody asked me, and, and this question I thought was interesting, he said, has anybody ever spoke, got up, and, and argued with you while he was preaching? I want to say not more than once. And I said, no. No, I've never had that happen. I've had people want to get aggravated in business meetings. That's different. But when I'm preaching, I've never had somebody stand up and say, you're wrong. Thank God. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know what I'd do. I'd probably go nuts. I've never had that. And I said, in fact, let me take it a step further. I said, from a biblical standpoint, nothing is more important than the anointed word. Right. To the point where we don't even allow the kids to operate when the preaching's going on. That God himself waits until after the preaching is done because God won't interrupt his own word. Yeah. Yeah. Now all these other folks sitting around the table that in the Bible study haven't got a clue what I'm talking about at that point. And they're just looking down at their Bible. But I'm telling you, I'm glad I know who he is. Yeah. I'm glad I'm in a church that allows the kids to operate. Amen. Praise God. But could it be? I just want to get to the point where God does something. I just said, hey, it's a God thing. I can't explain it. But you can't deny if it's God or not. Oh, hallelujah. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And I believe tonight the Holy Ghost is calling us. And I don't know. I, I, I do know this. There will be some that will say, I'm going up a little higher. There will be some, Brother Barnett, but see, that will say, I'm going to go after this. I'm going out into the deeper waters. And there will be others that is going to be happy and content right where you are. I'm not going to condemn you. I'm not going to say you're backslid. I'm not going to say any of those things because that would be wrong. But I am saying is, is that the Spirit is speaking to the church and saying, if you want to see what I have for you. Paul put it like this. He said, eye has not seen, ear has not heard. Now, we use this verse many times to talk about heaven. That verse, this verse is not talking about heaven. He said, eyes have seen, ears have heard, neither is recorded in the heart of man what God has prepared for his people here. Here. Read the entire chapter. The context is talking about the church now. Now, we can use it for heaven, I guess, if you want to, because we haven't seen heaven. We don't know what all God's got. And, then, and we preach and shout it to him. But I'm telling you, we don't even know what God wants to do for us now. And if we will come out of our comfort zone, God will take us to a level we, can, we, we didn't even realize existed. Hallelujah. The superstition of many years ago, before Columbus discovered America, the superstition went that the earth was flat. And nobody went out where they couldn't see land or the ocean because they believed you would just fall off and at the end of it, and they believed in all kinds of sea monsters that would come and take you in, and that was it. That was the superstition of the belief. It wasn't that Columbus said, I'm going out there. I'm going to find another place. Come to find out, looking back in history now, it was the Jewish people of Spain under the inquisition of the Spanish king and queen that went to Columbus and said, find us a place to go because they're persecuting us. And then they went and they found America. But it was only when someone decided, I'm going out there. I believe the earth is round, and I believe there's land somewhere else. And Columbus set sail in 1492, and he found what we know is America. For, and today we're so thankful for that. Why are you saying, brother friends, some of us believe the spiritual world is flat. And some of us believe there's a plateau that ends on a flat relationship. And we're only willing to go out so far because we're afraid of what's over there. But I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost is speaking to our church and saying, I need somebody that's brave enough to step out and say, I'm going for it. I'm going for it. I'm going to find what I'm looking for. 
I'm going to find that, that place in God that he's calling me to. Some of you may say, Brother Francis, I just want to get to where you are. No, don't stop with me. Let's go a little further than that. Hallelujah. Because the Spirit is talking to this church. Say, come. Come. Let's stand. Let's sing it tonight.
pray for me Wednesday night. I feel led of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to preach or teach. Probably I'm going to preach. I'm going to start out teaching. The power of submission. The power of submission. Now, we Pentecostals, the word submission is almost a cuss word. Come on, let's be honest. We, we don't like that concept of submitting, but I'm telling you there's a power in submission. And I, I want you to pray for me. I want everybody to be, if at all possible, you need to be here Wednesday night. Call somebody's not here and tell them you need to be there Wednesday night. I believe we could have just as explosive this Wednesday night as we did about a month ago when I taught about the spirit of fear and depression. I'm telling you, we're going to have a great time. So just pray for me. We need to deal with the power of submission. How many just God use me? Hallelujah. Lift your hands one more time. Let's give you praise tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, you're so good to us, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Help us, oh Lord, to know and realize. Hallelujah. 